When you think of war during the medieval times, are you picturing a lawless, primitive old world where nothing was tracked and everything was chaos? Well, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Despite what many Hollywood movies would have us believe, actual medieval society was far more sophisticated and rule-based than we think, and wars during those times were no exception. Warfare back then was supported by a highly intricate system of military financing. So how did they keep track of their wars and financing during medieval times? That's exactly what we're exploring here today, how these wars were funded and how the money was tracked. Before we go into how they tracked their finances, we need to understand how they got the money in the first place. How did those medieval generals finance their attacks? The truth is, they used a number of methods, but the most common one was taxation. Now this isn't a big surprise. It was called war tax or army tax. A percentage of the tax was gathered from the country and it was earmarked for an invasion or a defense strategy that was formulated by a country's army. This is very similar to how things work in the modern world. But army generals, like any savvy investor, relied on multiple sources. Let's say that a war was already going on in a foreign country. The generals couldn't really campaign for funding from their governments all the way back home. Instead, they got creative. They came up with financing through tributes. Any state or territory that was defeated or conquered during the war had tribute imposed upon them as part of the peace demand. Now this tribute could come in the form of a set amount of money or resources given to the victor, and this was an essential means of sustaining medieval armies during ongoing future operations. Another on-site financing method was ransom. The ransom market was an important and highly institutionalized part of the medieval economy, with its own brokers, regulations, and agents. Any high-ranking individual, such as a noble, bishop, or a knight captured during the war was held for ransom, and their release money was negotiated with the individual's families or allies. And no, unlike the Hollywood shows, the ransomers didn't operate like a modern-day cartel cutting off pieces of the prisoner and sending them to their families. Prisoners of wars were actually quite well treated, and it's not uncommon for a soldier to be captured multiple times during the course of a war. One English soldier, during the Hundred Years' War, was allegedly captured and ransomed a total of 14 times. During the latter medieval period, merchant banks and knight orders also became a good source of war finance. They would provide a loan either in the form of money on site, or as a document to be cashed at another one of their locations. Another means that emerged as the era progressed was the granting of wealthy individuals certain titles and privileges in the exchange for a lump sum contribution. And of course, if all other options failed, you could just loot the countryside and forcefully seize assets of cities and religious institutions. Plundering was in fact one of the biggest incentives why people joined the military. Salaries in the military was very meager during those times and it was not enough motivation to risk their lives over. And so it was a plan B for many military generals in case they couldn't provide their men with their salaries. They could offer plundering. As you can see, in the medieval times, they got super creative when it came to generating money for their wars. But now, we need to understand how they exactly kept track of all that money. There were a number of ways they got creative with their accounting. The simplest and most common way was through tally sticks. These were wooden sticks with notches that were used as a form of receipt and could be easily understood and calculated by even those who were illiterate. This form of accounting was used by all ranks in the military. As you can imagine, there were a lot of deals, negotiations, and exchanges that happened during wars. So some commanders started using this thing called a split tally stick. Basically, there were two parts split from the same stick, and each stick contained the same information about an exchange. One part was kept by the payer, and the other part by the payee. In China, a strikingly similar method was invented, except instead of conventional wood, they used bamboos. In fact, this form of accounting was so reliable that in the early days of the Bank of England, stocks were issued via split tallies. Now, when it came to more institutionalized exchanges using methods like night orders, churches, or even merchant banks, Banks, they used much more extensive ledgers and documentation. One such method was called the chirograph. This was a type of document that had been written in two to four duplicates on the same piece of parchment. When a transaction had been agreed upon, the document copies were separated by irregular cuts called indentures. Later on, transactions grew in size and complexity, and it became impractical for chirograph copies to be written on just one sheet. But the practice of indentation remained. One of the best surviving 
surviving examples of indentured documents is from the early 15th century England, confirming an agreement of cost between Henry V and various army captains supplying their men during the Battle of Agincourt. Okay, another interesting method was a version of a modern day UPS or FedEx agents. I know this sounds weird, but hear me out. If a general wanted any information regarding financial transactions, then messengers were deployed. These messengers were highly specialized individuals in their trade, possessing an excellent understanding of the terrain so that they could traverse great distances quickly. Most messengers were freelancers, but kings and high-ranking nobles employed their own private messengers, covering their expenses and accommodation, and they were even allowed to carry a royal decree, giving them certain rights and protections. It's almost like a crossover between a FedEx agent and a country's ambassador, I guess. In the medieval Middle East, even more intriguing methods were found. To send information or to carry financial documents, carrier pigeons were used. These were actually becoming a regular service between Baghdad and the Damascus during the time of the Crusades. It's important to note that the Arab world was also more proficient in mathematics, using it to conduct financial audits. It is from these practices that modern day algebra actually stems its roots. Outside of Eurasia, one indigenous method of recording exchanges was the use of quipus in pre-Columbian Southern America. These were systems of knots where colored strings and the knots represented numerical values. If you think about it, it's quite similar to the tally sticks that we mentioned earlier. Now, it's really interesting to think that all these creative tactics for tracking war finances during medieval times actually forms the basis of some of our modern day accounting methods. Medieval history is truly fascinating because a lot of what happened back then helps shape what most of our groundbreaking technologies and methods are today. If you like these kinds of deep dives into history on various topics, check out this video on the history of money. Thanks, and I'll see you on the next one.